space-time, the sun and the moon, physical objects, everything that we see inside of space and time is just our visualization tool. The reality we're interacting with is nothing like the visualization tool. There's nothing like space and time. We've made the rookie mistake of assuming that our headset, VR, our visualization tool, is the final reality. It's just a rookie mistake. It's, so, it's like someone who's played Grand Theft Auto so long, they have no idea there's a reality besides Grand Theft Auto. We're like that. All right, right. Well, let's, we, let's gotta start like square one. So just catch us up on quantum physics. Right? Well, the common sense world around us that we live and play with is Newtonian mechanics. Large objects that bump against other large objects, planets, meteors, comets, rocks, but at the tiny microscopic scale, a new kind of physics emerges, quantum physics. The physics that makes plastics and materials and flesh and blood all different. The thing that makes the world go round is quantum physics. And now we want to use that for computers. Quantum supremacy is that this is a very well-defined engineering milestone. In a nutshell, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that experimental quantum computers can surpass the best supercomputers in the world. The big news today is that Google researchers have achieved an incredible breakthrough in quantum computing. They've demonstrated with the quantum computer that it can perform a computation in seconds what would take the world's fastest supercomputer years, thousands of years, to do that same calculation. Our leadership has been, has been working on this program for the last 17 years. It's the longest running research program in the country. And after 17 years, uh, when we are showcasing the results, we are show showcasing results that are not just incredible, they're real. Well, here's a question that's not totally related, but you might be a good person for this. What is quantum computing? I keep hearing yep. about this. It's one of the big breakthroughs in, in computers is going to be quantum computing. Right. I'm almost the right guy. I'm not completely the right guy. Right. I actually um, did teach a course at Caltech that involved quantum computing. So I'm, well, I'm above average. <laughs> Definitely the best guy ever, right? But yeah. <laughs> so in classical mechanics, which is what came before quantum mechanics, let's imagine you have a bit, right? That is something is either zero or one, right? One piece of information. In quantum mechanics, you have a quantum bit, a qubit, as they call it very clever. So the difference is that instead of it being a zero or a one, like it would be classically, quantum mechanically, it is in some superposition of zero and one, in some combination of a little bit zero, a little bit one. Mm. And it's not that you don't know which one it is, it's that it really is both. It might be 90% zero and 10% one or something like that. A qubit is like Schrodinger's cat. It doesn't just have a value of a one or a zero. It is in superposition. Superposition means a superset of all the positions that are possible. If you think of an exponential growth problem, like, like cracking encryption, uh, it can be done by a regular computer. You can set up your laptop to, to crack. It'll take like a thousand years or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to go through every single possible value. So if you have 64 bits, that's like two to the 64 values, which is, which is huge. Uh, in fact, there's an old story about the, the Indian king and the the wise man who played chess that illustrates the story of how big that number gets when you have exponential growth. So there was a king who liked to play chess and no one wanted to play chess with him anymore because he, you know, he kept winning. And finally there's this wise man, he's like, please play chess with me. And the wise man says, okay, I'll play chess with you. If, if I win, for the first square in the chessboard, you give me one grain of rice. And then the second square in the chessboard, you give me, you double that, two grains of rice. And you double that to four grains of rice and six grains of rice. So we're doubling in each square, right? Mm -hmm. King's like, okay, sure. You know, no big deal. There's just a bunch of rice, right? And so it turns out when the wise man won, by the time you get to two to the 64, because there's 64 squares on the chessboard, that basically it was more rice than would fit in all of India, right? It, that's an exponential problem. Mm. It just grows so fast. And the reason it grows is there are too many possibilities. But now this new thing called a qubit is coming along. And the qubit has both possibilities at the same time. 
So if you have 64 bits and you take all the possible values of those 64 bits, you've got the same number of possibilities as the grains of rice we talked about. It's 2 to the 64. It's a very big number. It's, it's 18 quintillion, right, is the number. You mentioned it, breaking people's encryption codes, right? Right. What are you actually doing there? It's finding the prime numbers that you multiply together to make a very big number. That takes much longer than the current age of the universe for big numbers. Whoa. With any conceivable classical computer. But the quantum computer can do it in, in you know, a second or something. <laughs> and and the, 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 the explanation... Just what you just said, it's so yeah, crazy. But the explanation for how Whoa. it's doing it, a picture, is what it's doing is the calculations in multiple universes. And, and, and many, I mentioned David Deutsch earlier, who's the instigator of many of these algorithms early on, who, who would say that. He would say, this is what is happening. There is no other explanation. How do you explain the fact that this quantum computer can do something that no classical computer can ever do? How do you explain it? Where is it doing the math? Oh <laughs> right? And he would say, he would say, it's doing it in the multiple universes. Oh. Um, but it's amazing, isn't it, that we're beginning to use those things not for computing yet, because they're really hard to program. But we do, physicists have gone, this is great, because Google and Microsoft have spent billions of dollars building these things because they want to build these computers. But they're perfect laboratories for quantum mechanics. <laughs> so wow. you can do abstract research into quantum mechanics on them which I find fascinating. That, that's actually more fascinating than using them to crack everybody's codes. Yeah, it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, you know, factoring large numbers, it's kind of boring, but building wormholes. Yes. Which is, and I, I caution, it's not, it, it's a complicated thing, but it, it looks like the beginnings of a laboratory to build structures like that. That's so fascinating. So let's assume we get past the encryption code issue. Okay. What are the next tasks to apply this awesome power of computing to? Cyber medicine. We're talking about curing cancer, curing Alzheimer's disease. Right now we can't, and tomorrow we will? That's right. We're talking about millions of times more states and computer power in a quantum computer, which is going to revolutionize medicine, energy, space travel, transportation, you name it, everything is going to be overturned in the same way that the transistor overturned everything after the war. Give me an example of a task greatly improved by quantum computing. Because I don't know anyone here who's saying, you know, the, my computer is too slow. Take a look at photosynthesis. The world economy depends on photosynthesis. That's why we eat. That's why there's food photosynthesis, but we still haven't been able to model photosynthesis in a computer because it's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. Light that grabs carbon dioxide turns into sugar. That is a quantum mechanical operation that we cannot model using Newtonian mechanics. Right now, if I were to look out there, is anything touched by quantum computing? Not yet. It's not ready yet. Not ready for prime time. When will it be? Like next week? On the web, you can actually play with a quantum computer. It's very primitive, only does a handful of qubits, but you can actually program a quantum computer on the internet tonight with maybe 10, 15 qubits. Now eventually we want to, we want to have qubits in the thousands and millions. On behalf of our amazing team, I'm proud to announce Willow. Willow is Google's newest and most powerful superconducting quantum computing chip, and the next step in our path towards building large-scale quantum computers and exploring their applications. Our logical qubits now operate below the critical quantum error correction threshold, a long sought-after goal for the quantum computing field since the theory was discovered in the 90s. The reason quantum computing has been so slow to progress is that the industry has been struggling with problems making qubits reliable and resistant to noise.
progress has been incremental. Now, our team at Microsoft has been able to take a subatomic particle that has only been theorized until now, and not only observe it, but control it, creating an entirely new material, one that can scale to millions of qubits on a single chip. Majorana allows us to create a topological qubit. A topological qubit is reliable, small, and controllable. This solves the noise problem that creates errors in qubits. Now that we have these topological qubits, we're able to build an entirely new quantum architecture, the topological core. Every single atom in this chip is placed purposefully. It is constructed from ground up. It is entirely a new state of matter. Think of us as building the picture by painting it atom by atom. In a regular chip, the computation is done using electrons. We don't use electrons for compute. We use Majoranas for compute. It's an entirely new particle. It's half electron. Our first quantum processor based on this architecture is the Majorana 1.